Hey everyone, welcome to this impromptu live stream. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna shut my door real quick. All right, great. So um, today we're going to be working through the problems from the ICPC North America East Division. Um, I believe this includes the uh, Greater New York Regional, the uh, East Central Regional. I'm not sure is Northeast NA also today. Let's see. Um, their website still has 2022 information, so it might just be, um, yeah, it might just be East Central and Greater New York. Um, cool, and let's see, we actually have a live scoreboard up for the start of the contest. Uh, let's see how things are going. Looks like so there's some quick solves to A and E and 12 problems in total. Anyway, so we have this open division contest that's going to start in three minutes. I don't think I can... Oh, I could see the problems actually. I uh, guess we can go ahead and start once I finish this explanation. Um, anyway, we have an open contest that uses these same problems. I'm going to be working through... Oh, uh, let's see here. There's like some northeast teams. Um, oh yeah, looks like this is east central and northeast NA. Interesting. Anyway, we're going to be working through the same problems um, on a separate contest and I'm going to be going through these a little bit more slowly than I, or than I would if I was solving on my own because the main goal of this stream is to give a bit of educational content and some insight on how I approach a contest by talking through my thought process and um, yeah, by talking through or through my th thought process, showing you how I come to the solution and explaining my ideas in real time um, as we go. Uh, let's see. Maybe just so that, maybe just to make the timing consistent, I'll just wait until the uh, two minute mark, and then because I'm competing as a team of one, I'm giving myself a few advantages over the typical ICPC rules, uh, such as I'm not going to hold myself to the, um, I'm not going to hold myself to the no pre-written code rule, I'm going to use my templates, and I'm also going to allow myself to use the, uh, um, to use the standings from the real contest to try and figure out which problems I think are the easiest. And yeah, I'm actually, I'm also going to see, it looks like, uh, Ecknerwala is hosting a stream of Greater New York, so anyone who's interested can see that, I think. They might be on the same problems because I know that they are trying to coordinate um, to do the two rounds on the same day, but we will see. All right, cool. So we start in just over a minute and a half. Um, and by the way, um, again, unlike in most uh, contest live streams, I will have chat open during the round and I will be answering questions actively. So. Please uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat uh, if and when you have any. Okay, let's see. Are there any other problems that I need to be looking at? Looks like U of Toronto uh, has become the first team to solve two problems. Let's see. I kind of want to see if I recognize any of the names on. Let's see, Carnegie Mellon. There's MIT Mex Foundation. What are the other MIT teams? Ooh. Yeah, this team is stacked. Yeah. Okay, I'm calling it this team. This team right here, everyone, just like to make this prediction public for everyone on this stream, this team right here wins NAC 2024. Uh, I'm calling that. That is definitely happening and very likely World Finals 2024 as well. Cool. All right. Uh, looks like we can get started in just a moment. All right. Let's look at A first. Okay. We got like quick sort situation. Um, okay. Assuming the array has been partitioned to terminal values, it could be the pivot. Okay. So, <clears throat> so for X to be a pivot, it must be 
higher than all the values before it and lower than all the values after it. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just make a list of all prefix maxima and, or all numbers that are the maximum on their prefix and the minimum on, and then the minimum on their suffix and I'll just print the numbers that could be both. Um, yeah, seems good to me. Uh, let's see. Wait, this is the weirdest input format. Wait, no, I don't need to do multi-testing. Okay. So I'm going to do is prefix maximum. Um, so let's see, so I'm going to start with a negative one and then if a of i. Actually, here, I'll just, I'll, this will be a little faster. If a of i is bigger than x, this pm of i is true. It's false. Okay. Um, so these will be the positions that we're looking for. All right, and so if this is larger, or if this is a suffix, no, wait, this should be a minimum. So the maximum value is less than mod. So if it's less, and uh, yeah, pause.pbi, and then we got to reverse because we want these in increasing order. And I'm going to do i plus 1 because we're 1 indexing. All right. Oh wait, hold on. Um, we want the values, not the indices. So we'll just do this and new line at the end. Uh, oh, whoops. Okay, that is not correct. Um, let's first make sure we're doing this part right. Oh, uh, whoops, this is the wrong order. Yep, there we go. Um, any other samples to look at? Nope. Cool. All right, let's switch over to E, which looks to be the second easiest problem now, and we get a, a quick AC, that's good. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is too much text. Let's see, what's the example? Average number of kernels per year is this. It's just like Is it just like multiply three things and divide by the last? Is that like what's going on? Oh oh no, Han, we need to I don't understand what it mean what this part means. Like are they just saying the result of every calculation will be an integer? Okay. Um Right, I'm just gonna, mm, yeah, I'm gonna assume that I've read, the, or that I've interpreted the problem correctly. I think we just need to like, okay, um, hold on. So I think, first of all, we need to read in five things, take their product, and add them up. Uh, and then, and take their, and then I think we're taking their average. And then um, we're gonna multiply by, this first number on the second line and divide by the second and then output the result. I think that's what they're asking me to do. Um, and we shall check that assumption now. 
150, 172, 150. Okay, I. This problem is painful to read, but I'm going to assume that I read it correctly and just submit. Yep. Cool, looks good. All right, um, so there's a solve on F. I could read other problems, but like if F can be solved this quickly, then presumably I should. Presumably it's fine to just go for it, so I will. All right, we have n numbers, each is a power of two. We can remove or a number or merge two. Play until a single number remains. What's the largest number we can obtain? Does this mean, oh God, does it like, this is so stupid. Why are they making us? Okay, th this is very dumb. They're making us use, actually no, okay. I think we can do this within 128. I don't know why they're making us like print the actual largest number and not log base 2 of the largest number, um, but anyway, okay, hold on, so with that, let me think about how we actually are going to go about this. Um, with n up to, or an O of n cube solution, would be to run a range dp, where dp of i of j is the largest number we can get out of the, the interval i to j. Um, but the transition for this dp, oh, I wonder if we can transition by like binary searching for the point at which the, um, Oh, um, yeah, maybe we can do this. Let's transition by binary searching for the k in i to j, where dp of i of k is equal to dp of k plus 1 of j, because we're only going to get any value out of merging if, um, yeah, we're only going to get any value out of merging two numbers if they're to get this one if they're the same. And otherwise, we might as well just, um, yeah, otherwise... Um, dp of i of j is equal to, and then other, I guess our other options are dp of i of j can be equal to dp of i plus 1 of j, or dp of i minus 1 of j. Cool. Um, do I want to use int128, or do I want to read them in Python, or do this in Python? Maybe, I think I'll do int128. Mm, yeah. That's really disgusting. This is very unnecessary. I wonder if the intended solution is to just, is to involve the fact that they're less than two to 100 or if for some reason they chose that limit to allow, um, hold on. Let's see, so. I think, um, yeah, to allow M128, or if they wanted to, um, but like, or, and then they also wanted to disallow long, long for some reason. Anyway, um, first let me write a function to convert M128 to strings. So let's see. All right. Um, So I'm going to just store a list of the powers. Oops. Okay. Now I think we can do this without dealing with any M128 madness. So I'm going to let a of i be the log base 2 of 
the actual input. dp of i i is a of i and then actually okay hold on for d for distance from one to n for i n if j is going to be i plus d if j is at least n then we break okay um mid and then if dp of all right so dp of i of j we're going to set to oh hold on word cool okay dp of i of j is initially going to be max of dp of i plus one of j dp of i of j minus one and then if dp of i of low equals dp of low plus one j then dp of i j can also be dp of i of low plus one on the sample, good enough for me. I'm not that confident that this is, actually hold on, I'm gonna make sure that I'm computing like the large powers correctly. Let's just check this real quick. Uh, all right, looks right to me. Cool, um, yeah, I think we're good to go. Let's send it. Sir. All right. Um, okay, let's figure out what's going on here. Our input reading looks fine to me. So I think there must be an issue with our DP. Oh, oh, you know what this is? I have to, right, the answer can actually be up to like 2 to the 110, I think. Uh, here, I'll just do 120 to be safe. Um, if we have like a bunch of 100s that all get merged. That would do it. I should have thought about that. So we need to actually in compute these large powers of 2. There we go. Alright. Bit of a silly penalty, but it's fine. Let's have a look at the scoreboard. So it looks like Okay, B has been opened, and is this K has been opened, or L? Actually, here, I can just look at the solve stats here. Okay. B and K have been opened. Um, I'll just read both of them and pick one to do. Oh, no, is this going to be geometry? Let's see. Maybe not, actually. Okay. Um, we have two parallel streets we're going to install. K access points on road B, which lies midway through. We want to minimize the sum of the squares of distances from of each user from their nearest access point. Is this just aliens trick? Maybe there's something easier we can do. Let's see. 
Um, Interesting. First of all, does it does the distinction between people on the two streets even matter? I don't think it does. Yeah, I don't think it matters at all. Wait, so can we just do DP or so? Yeah, let's just merge the two streets. And then we'll let dp of i of j be the minimum cost for satisfying i customers using j access points. And then, um, yeah, and then we can transition from dp of i of j to dp of k of j plus one. Um, this is going to be n squared big O of what? k n plus m squared, which might be a little tight, depends on what the time limit is. Uh, four seconds, I think that's fine. Um, yeah, okay, let's just go for this. I think this is not bad. Is this, what problem is this? B? Cool. Um, okay, I'm going to use regular doubles rather than long doubles because I think time may be a concern and I'm not that worried about precision. Oh, I guess one question is um, how to quickly if it compute the transitions. So we need to find the minimum cost of satisfying uh, people i through k minus 1 with a single Um, yeah, with a single access point. So I know we're going to place it at the midpoint, and then we need to find the sum of a of i minus midpoint squared, which is sum of a of i squared minus two sum midpoint sum of a of i plus number of values midpoint squared. Okay, so I think if we just do prefix sums over the squares of the positions and the positions themselves, then this will be fine. Um, cool. Yeah, let's go for it. What's the... Oh, we get the distance separating the two rows. Cool. Alright, and I'm just going to divide the distance by two because that's the actual distance separating the two roads. Oh wait, hold on, but we have to, oh wait, um, no, because the, the distance, well, let's see, we want to minimize the sum, of, oh, sum of squared distances, so this is just sum of this distance squared plus s squared, which is fine. Um, great. Okay, factoring an s is not hard. All right, so dp of n plus 1, k plus 1. And then we're going to initialize it 2018. And then dp of 0, 0. X, um, just so I can, I'm going to allow us to like waste some access points at the beginning just to make computing the answer really easy. And then now, OK. So now for i from 1 to n and j from 1 to k. Um, or actually, now so I'll go through this dimension first. OK, and hold on. I guess I need to compute the prefix sums and the prefix sums of squares first.
All right, and then the cost. All right, so let's see. So, so the midpoint is going to be a or positive i plus positive j minus one divided by two. And then let's use our formula here. So it's going to be so sum of a of i squared minus two times midpoint times sum of a of i. Um, plus number of values, which is j minus i times midpoint squared plus s squared. And just to reduce the number of multiplications I need to do, I'm just going to square s up here. Luxia asks, how, how much rated would this problem be on code forces? Uh, I would guess like 1600-ish would be reasonable, maybe give or take. Okay, so now for k up to k, we can min dp of i or of j of k plus one dp of i of k plus cost. And then let's actually make sure we're getting the precision right. So see out fix set precision. Fifteen, I think is fine. And yeah, I think we should be good. Did I, oh, where is NPS? I'll just stick in another P. All right. Okay, it looks like this is not quite right. Um, okay, hold on, so let's see. Oh, it's because the position shouldn't be the midpoint, it should be like the weighted it should be the average along the uh, segment. Okay, this is easy to fix. So, ps of j minus ps of i. I think this is right. Um, well, here, let's see. If we want to minimize this thing with respect to mid the midpoint, if we take the derivative, we get number of values, two number of values midpoint. We're taking the derivative of this thing in, with respect to the midpoint and setting it equal to zero to find the minimum minus two sum of a of i is equal to zero and solving gives midpoint equals sum of a of i divided by number of values. Yep, cool. All right. Um, and that seems to do the trick. Okay, I'm hoping that this doesn't TLE. Um, it like will be a little bit tight, but I think we'll be fine. And I did change along double to double, right? Yeah. Uh oh, okay, there we go. Looks like it might be a little bit tight under the time limit, but it is passing so far. And I feel like if it passes one large test case, it should eventually pass all of them, so. Seems fine. Okay, I assume this is going to pass. I assume there's not like some evil test case coming up at the end. Great, wait, runtime point 17 seconds? Why was judging taking so long then? I mean, I guess I'm not complaining. Uh, okay, let's check the solve stats. Okay, looks like K might have been easier actually. Um, there, are two, there are three solves already. Okay, what is this? It's like a pair, of, we got a pair of crosswords. Uh, I see. Interesting. Each pair. Okay, so we have a word list. And we need to find pairs that differ in exactly two consecutive letters. And be the only possible pairs that work for these sets of letters. So I see. Um, 
Okay, can we just like... Okay. Yeah, I think this is pretty easy. I think, okay, so I think we can do this just by, um, we're gonna brute force over the pairs of words. We're going to find the positions of differences, of differences in the two words. If there are exactly two differences, we can mark that we found a solution for those two letters, and we can output the number of pairs of letters for which we have exactly one solution. Cool, let's type this. So I'm gonna have the count of solutions for each possible pair of letters. And so first of all, if the two words have different sizes, then we can't use them. So I'm gonna store the position of the first difference and I'll initialize that to the size of the string. And the last difference, which I'll initialize to negative one. And then if there are two, exactly two adjacent differences, FD, FD and LD should just be one apart. Oh wait, hold on, there needs to be, um, this needs to be four dimensional. Oh, and then one other thing I'll have to deal with is the characters in S and the characters in I are indistinguishable. So, hold on. So I'll just take one to be, take the, put the minimum of the two pairs first. like the sizes matter so let's see okay maybe I need to store this in a map um, okay this is a, this is kind of messy so hold on so how many cases that are so how many possible solutions are there there are 26 to the 4 at times 20 square positions where the um, letters could be in, which is about more than 10 to the 8. So yeah, I think I'd better like create a state struct or a, a solution struct. Um, yeah. Actually, I can just use like array of int six. And I'll just say, yeah, I think this is fine.
Okay, this is K. All right, we got this right. So yeah, I think because I think then as long as we have like the position, the length of the word, the two letters, and then the position of the two letters right, I think we should get the correct count. And then the complexity is n squared times log n plus length, which is 20. So I think we should be fine to avoid TLE as well. Nice, quick AC. Very good. Cool. All right. Have any other problems been opened yet in the real contest? I has. It's 15% AC rate, so I might look for look to try to open some new problems myself if uh, if this seems annoying. But let's have a look. Okay, we need to convert ISBN tens to thirteens. What does it mean for there to be like a corresponding 10 and 13? Because they're only, uh, like, how are we getting all the extra digits? Uh, Prepend 978. Okay, so what are the details we need to look through? Um, all right, check some digit is an X if it instead of a 10. Um, and this doesn't apply to 13. Can contain. Uh, Itachi asks, can we get the problem set? Yes, I will put a link in the chat. Okay, so cannot begin or end with a hyphen and it cannot contain consecutive hyphens. And each character is going to be either a base 10 digit, a hyphen, or X. Okay, so it seems like we have a couple of steps here. So step one is going to be checking uh, validity. And so that means, so first of all, we need to check that we the first or that um, the hyphen rules are satisfied um, step two uh, and so this means so let's see so up to three not a beginning or end and no consecutive Narajat says, I hit candidate master yesterday. Hey, congratulations. It's a, a cool accomplishment. Um, yeah, that's great. Nicely done. Okay, let's see. So, um, oh, if there are, if there are three, then one must be right before Check some. Okay. So then all the first all non hyphen digits must be zero to nine. Except the last must be zero to nine. And then last digit must satisfy check some rule. Okay. So it says implementation problems like this make me cry. Uh, hold on, 
I'm feeling a little bit evil, so I'm going to send you... Okay, why don't you try this one? <laughs> um, yeah, have fun with that. Okay, so for step two, we're going to need to convert to ISBN 13. So we're just going, so, we're, or so the string S is going to be 978 plus just the original. Oh, 978 and then hyphen original. And then compute checksum digit. Okay, this doesn't seem that bad. I'm probably going to eat those words, but I think this will be fine. Oh, um, except except after the original, except we're going to do not include the last digit because that's a checksum. Um, cool. Yeah, let's implement this. I think this will be okay. Now that I've written out all the details, I don't think that this is going to be too hard to get right. I think it was it would have been very easy to miss the if there are three, then one has to be right before the checksum rule. Um, so this is problem I. So this is how, how to be like me. <laughs> I'm flattered. Um, no, I mean, really, it's just a lot of practice. I, I've been doing this for eight years now, I think. Um, yeah, since the end of 2015. Um, so ultimately, like, it just comes, it just has been a matter of putting a lot of time into practicing. Okay, so... This is multi-tested. That's good. All right, so. All right, so first let's make sure that. Let's count the hyphens. We're guaranteed that the length is going to be like pretty small, right? Yeah, 10 and 13. All right, cool. Um, I'm gonna let do that. Rosh asks, how old was I in 2015? I was 15. Um, I was a uh, I was a ninth grade student in high school, and um, I started with the uh, USA Computing Olympiad contest series. Would you make videos on each topic in competitive programming someday? Probably, probably not, unless I felt like I had something um, clever and original to say. I think there are enough high quality resources out there right now um, on like usico.guide um, for videos there's like all of Erikto's streams and uh, things like that that I don't expect to make topic videos unless I feel like I have something substantial that I could add. Nope, not invalid. <laughs> invalid and okay, there we go. Okay, and then if the count of hyphens is equal to three, then we need s of n minus two, the second to last thing, to be a hyphen. Okay, I think this is all the hyphen rules. Um, Yep, okay. All right, so now let's check the, uh, so now, okay, so first of all, if, so if we have any, I think it can only, we can only have digits, hyphens, and x's. So if anything except the last is an x, it's invalid. And then we need to return here. Um, and I'm going to find the total, the sum of the dig digits here. So let's see, it's like 10 times the first digit, 9 times the last, right? Or 9 times the second and so on. So if it's not an x in it, so if it's not a hyphen, it's a digit. So tote is going to go up to next times 
s of i minus 0. Um, all right. And uh, next minus minus. OK. So the character that we want is going to be equal to 0 plus tote. And then if tote is equal to 10, c is going to be x. Um, suppose someone wants to do competitive programming. How would you advise them to start from scratch? Um, so, that, or so, I mean, it depends a little bit on whether you've seen any programming before. I think the first thing I would do is take a course or read a book on programming. Afterwards, I would just start trying to solve problems. And the, the way you should go about this depends a little bit on what your goals are. What I did and what I think is actually like a reasonable learning path for newcomers is I solved the Yusuko, um, I solved the Yusuko problems from around the starting from around like the 2015 to 2016 16 seasons and I think the newer seasons are a little bit less friendly to newcomers but the old Yusuko problems are nice because they are um, because they offer like a good way to learn some of the fundamental data structures and algorithms where like it where um, they're like basic basically there are basic exercises of different algorithms Whereas in most modern contests, because there's a lot of pressure for problems to be original, you won't ever see, for example, just an easy breadth first search problem. You'll only see breadth first search when it's used as part of a more complicated idea. And so solving the old Yusuko problems is a good way to pick up some of the fundamentals. And if you like encounter a problem and you didn't know an algorithm um, that was required, then you can um, look it up in resources like uh, the Competitive Programmer's Handbook, which I'll link in the chat. Um, I can do, find it. Or the uh, Yusuko Guide. So those are some resources I would recommend to someone getting started. All right, so if it's not C, then the checksum fails. You were so motivating. Thank you. OK. Um, so now I think I think we're good on checking everything. Did I miss anything? Nope. All right. Is there a pop back for strings? I'm going to compile this real quick. Yep. OK, cool. All right, so now we just need to compute the checksum digit. Do I need to check uh, that they're exactly 10 digits? I think, I guess I should. Yeah. All right, so if, so yeah, if the number of hyphen, the number of hyphens should have to be equal to, okay, and then if, they, if it's equal to the size of S minus 10, then we have 10 digits and CH non-digits. Niraj asks, what about someone who's already candidate master to reach master and above? Once you're a candidate master, I think you're at the point where you've learned most of the basic ideas necessary to do well in programming contests and you have a general sense of how to think about problems, which means like at that point, I really think it's just fine to, to solve problems from the code forces archive. Um, a good way to do this is to filter problems on the C list or using C list for problem rating since the code forces problem ratings don't seem like they're being actively updated. Um, and uh, then if you filter by if you filter by problems to, or by rating to find problems that are suitable for your level, you can then like spend some time thinking about them re and then if you find a problem that you can't solve, you can read through the solution and figure out what you could have done to come up with it the next time. Rosvon asks, um, since uh, or, um, in order to get ideas to solve modern problems, would it be better to first know the basic problems for particular algorithms? Yeah, I think knowing the like basic use cases of different algorithms is, a pre is pretty helpful. And one way to do this is on the same site as the uh, Competitive Programmer's Handbook, there's an online judge with some fairly standard problems. But I think the old Yusuko problems are a little bit closer to sort of like 
introductory examples of where you might see different algorithms in the wild. So I felt like that was a really good resource and um, it helped me a lot when I was getting started. Okay, so let's compute this checksum. So let's see, we're gonna start, so the first dit multiplier is gonna be a three, and then oh, we already declared next. Simon asks how to get better at detecting DP problems. Uh, there's not too much I can say other than like, other than um, just like doing a lot of problems. I think the other helpful bit of intuition is that DP usually is helpful in cases where it seems like we can't, or where it seems difficult to make any like helpful observations that mean that like maybe you can either like greedily construct the solution or you can only like, or you can reduce like the number of solutions that might work to like a smaller size or anything like that. Like DP is usually useful when you want to like exhaustively check every possible solution, but of course you have to do so in a more efficient way than a complete search. Uh, let's see, is this right? I think this is right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I did through the, I did I did this problem while I was talking with you all, so I could have gotten distracted, but. I think I checked everything. I guess we'll find out though. Nice. Accepted. Yay. Alright, um, anything else? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many of I do I have? Six. Which one have I not done yet? Have I done all of these? Oh, have I not done C? Oh, huh. This is uh, this problem. I guess has been going on. Has been attempted a long time ago, and I just have ignored it. Cool. Um, interesting. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, so we have like the Colatz function, and we want to compute the minimum n that generates a given. Um, call it sequence. Let's see. So first of all, what's like the maximum even stopping time of any number up to two to the forty-seven? I wonder. Uh, it can still be pretty large, actually. It can still take a lot of steps. Oh wait, is this uh Oh, up to but not including the first power of two. Hold on. Okay, I wonder if I can, yeah, maybe I can just do like casework on what the power of two we get to is. Am I getting, um, I feel like I might need int 128 for this, but I should see if I can convince myself that the answer is gonna, that like the power of two we're gonna use is gonna be at most, uh, yeah, you know what, I'm not convinced of this, actually, we might need to just use int 128s. Okay, so what I'm thinking is we can do, 
oh, do casework over the power of two we reach. Um, and then just reverse the operations by, and find the value we get. And I think then the smallest starting power of two, the, the smallest pow starting power of two will give us the best, uh, the smallest answer. So this is C. Actually, hold on, let's see, which was the problem where I had to use int 128s already? Was it F? Yeah, I'm gonna copy over that code because it might be used. In fact, we're all, we're gonna need to compute powers of 10 all over again. Um, So the maximum possible value we could ever get is about um that starting from 2 to the 47 is about 10 to the 38, which is oh gosh, is this even going to be let's see, this is kind of a mess um, okay hold on yeah, this might even be a pain to fit into an in 128. I almost wonder if I should just do this in Python. Yeah, but I don't trust myself to write Python. <laughs> oh, well, every no two O's are adjacent, actually. Maybe this bounds the size that we can do. 2 to the 47 times 1.5 to the... Okay, maybe this can, maybe we actually can fit this in a long, long. Um, yeah, because if we do like alternating odds and evens, we'll only get up to like about 3 times 10 to the 8. So I think I'm going to try and do this with long, longs. I, they guarantee that it's composed of E's and O's, so I don't know why they tell us we have to check that the sequence contains only E's and O's, but I'm going to do that just in case.
All right, let's see. Is this all the ways that a sequence can fail? Oh, whoops. Um, okay, this says invalid. Um, okay, so if we do 12, what's it going to be at the end? We're going to have 12, 24, 48, Oh, wait, even is dividing by 2. Hold on. 12, 6, 3, 10, 5, 16. All right, so. Oh, this should be if S of I is O. I wish there was more sample tests, um, but I think this is fine, potentially. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to try this. Yep, nice. Okay, and I see there are a few questions in the chat that I've missed, so I'm going to go over those now. Um, Rosvon asks, during college, how would you study for math? Um, I'm in my first year of university. I take notes on paper and write them in LaTeX afterwards in Vim. That makes sense. So I'm I'm fast enough at this point at typing Vim or at typing LaTeX in Vim thanks to using like extensions with snippets that I can just live tech. Um, yeah, that I can just live tech notes in Vim during lectures and while I read my um, textbooks, and so that's usually what I do. But I think ta I think taking notes on paper and then if you find it useful having them typed afterwards, then doing that after is also a totally fine approach. Um, okay, so I asked, sorry, I can't uh, I can't read Arabic, so I can't pronounce your name. Um, is there any course that helps to be better, or is it just practicing? I haven't found any courses that I think are that I think are great. I do think like that there are resources like the Competitive Programmer's Handbook and the Use to Code Guide linked above that you can follow in some ways like a course um, to improve. But anyway, I haven't found any like formal classes that I feel like work super well. Unless you know maybe if your class opens or if your college has a competitive programming class, then that could be good. Um, Niraj says, what about using bit manipulation here? I'm not sure bit manipulation is nicely suited to dealing with the odd operations where to reverse them we have to subtract by one and divide by three. Okay, um, let's check what the st status is. Looks like there are um, some solves on G, so we can do those. Uh, I kind of hope this is going to be a tree problem. Doesn't look like it though. Um, Naraj says, can you go over your implementation here? Yeah, I'm going to assume for that this is for C. Okay. Um, so basically, what I'm going to do for this problem is we're told that the, uh, the last number in the set has to be a power of 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-compute all the powers of 2, and I'm going to check, can this be the ending number? And then because the... Uh, and then because um, the callouts function is like sort of monotonic in a sense. Um, or no, because like, and, or, and basically I said that we're going to want to end at the smallest power of two that gives us a valid sequence. Because each of both the E and the O functions are like monotonic, where if you put in a higher value, you get out of a higher value. So I'm going to read in the string and I'm going to check that it's like valid so there aren't two consecutive O's which are not allowed as it says over here. And then I'm going to iterate over the powers of two and for each power of 2, I'm going to check if it's valid. So one thing I want to do is avoid long, long overflow. And to do that, I'm maintaining a cap value, 4 times 10 to the 18. And the cap value is going to be larger than any potential value we could get during this process. And the reason I know that 4 to the 8 times 10 to the 18th is higher enough, or is high enough, is that the maximum starting value is 2 to the 47. And um, if we, the worst case where we're like going to make it the biggest is if we do an odd operation followed by an even operation repeatedly. 
and each time we do an odd, that's going to multiply it by 3, and every time we do an even, that's going to divide by 2. So it's going to multiply by 3 halves, and we can do that at most 25 times, since the total length of the string is at most 50. So the largest thing that we could possibly get is about 3.5 times 10 to the 18th. So now I'm going to reverse. So now I'm going to, or so now I'm going to go through all of the operations in reverse. If we, the last thing we needed to do is an odd. Um, oh, and one thing I actually didn't check. I feel like maybe this should have gotten me wrong answer. Um, oh wait, no, it didn't. Never mind. Okay. Um, yeah. So the one thing. So I'm going to go. If I if I see that the last operation was odd, I'm going to basically reverse an odd operation by subtracting one and then dividing by three, and I'm going to make sure that we are like allowed to divide by 3, we're going to get an integer result, that we're not like getting into negative val values, and that like in the end the number that we started from actually was odd. And otherwise, I'm going if, it, if the last operation was an even, I'm going to reverse it by multiplying by 2, and I'm going to have to make sure that we didn't go too high. And note that after we multiply by 2, I don't have to check is v now even, because of course after we multiply by 2, we get a multiple of 2. Um, yeah, and then I can just output v and then return. Uh, ADT asks, what text editor are you using? It looks cool. Uh, I use Vim. Uh, my setup is described at this video. Okay, cool. Let's move on to G. All trees look alike. We have a map of the trees. All trees are in its coordinates. Not all coordinates are occupied. We know the x and y distance to each tree within range. But the robot is in an unknown direction. Um, okay, hold on. Interesting. Okay, I wonder, can we just like brute force this? Well, no, not exactly. Okay, so a brute force idea is just to, wait, no, maybe we can. Um, so we're going to iterate over which um, orientation The robot is facing, and um, and which tree the is the first one sends. So from there we'll over we'll iterate over all sensor over all trees and make sure they match a sensor. Um, Yeah, we'll iterate over all trees and make sure that they match that they match one of our um, that they match one of our sensors or are out of range. And if so, we store this x y as a potential solution. Um. Okay, let's see, is there anything? And then the one thing I have to deal with is to deal with the di different directions. I, there's actually a clever way I can do this. I'll just rotate the sensor, or I'll assume for now, or to start, that the uh, x's in our sensor are positive, are in the plus x direction, and the y's are in the minus, or the plus y direction. And then four times I'll rotate the sensors by 90 degrees and then repeat the check. What's the time limit on this? So two second time limit and the time complexity. We're going to be using a set here, I believe. So um, I think this is, I think we'll use a set, yeah. Actually, no, our max is going to be. Our max is under a thousand, 
So I can save some, I can make this more efficient if I have to. And I think I will need to do this. I'm gonna, our max is less than 1000, so I can just use an array to store the sensor readings. Um, so that's it, so the complexity is just going to be four times NT times N S. Cool, I think that works. Um, yeah, let's type this. This is not that bad. Right, so I'm just gonna use this array and then so for each sensor. And I'm also going to have a, uh, I'm gonna s store one of the sensor locations that we can use to like map or to match on for the first part of our algorithm. Okay, so is sense xs plus mx, ys plus mx is true. Oh wait, hold on, since the Okay, yeah, so each of these things has, each of x and y has to be less than a thousand in absolute value. So yeah, this should never like be negative or anything. Oh, but there are m of these. Okay. So. So I'll have xa and ya for our answers and then for i, or for like, I'll say r for root up to n. So x is going to, or I'll say xc for x current is going to be, okay, actually, hold on, for d4, and then the end of each direction. Oh, hold on, maybe I need to actually store the sensor locations. Okay, so at the end of each direction, um, I'm gonna reset the sensor, so is, and then, and then I'm gonna rotate, so how do I rotate by 90 degrees? Um, so we're initially in positive x, positive y, so now our, x component needs to be negative y and our y component needs to be positive x. Okay, so now we can iterate over our root. going to be x of r minus xs of 0, yc is going to be y of r minus ys of 0. All right, so the Manhattan distance here is going to be abs of xc minus x of i plus abs of yc minus y of i if md is less than r and um, okay, if MD is less, if our distance is less than R and, but we're not, we don't have a sensor at XC minus, at X of I minus XC. Then this is bad. Okay, so now if this is an answer, if x a, so first of all, if we haven't found anything yet, we're gonna take take our x answer to be x c, y answer to be y c, 
and then if we found a different answer, so if the x's aren't the same or the y's aren't the same, we're going to output, what was the and's output here? Ambiguous. Okay. And at the very end, if x a is mod, we're going to output, oh, and I have to return here. not a lot of sample input, which is annoying. Uh, what problems? This is F, G. All right, that's right. So let's do one that's impossible. Um, okay, hold on, how can I make it impossible? Okay, I think this should work. And now let's see if I can do one where it's ambiguous. You know what, actually, that's too much work. I think that this is fine. Oh, wrong answer, okay. Um, hold on, I'm gonna see if I have any questions. A, uh, ADTF, is there any video for customizing the text editor like mine? Yeah, I sent a link in the chat a little bit earlier. And someone says, where can I find standings of university teams? Uh, here's a link. Okay, let's figure out what's going wrong here. Maybe I should check if the rotation is working. I think the rotation is fine. Um, but I guess the question is, what isn't working fine? If there are two or more distinct locations, okay, so hold on. Um, okay, that's a bug. Let's see if there's anything else. I thought that it was if two or more distinct. I didn't realize that we have to print ambiguous if the orientation is ambiguous. Um, right, that definitely fixes part of this. Um, is there anything else that I need to deal with? Um, de -dum, de -dum, de -dum. Uh, this is a sensor. Uh, it's a little bit surprising to me that that's tested on, that this bug is caught on test two, which is why I'm kind of concerned. I know that this is fixing something, but I don't know if it's, uh, I guess I don't know for sure if it's fixing, or if it's like the only bug. Okay, I'm gonna submit this, and I don't know if any of you guys see any bugs in here, 
Uh, I guess you can let me know. Oh, uh, is that? Okay, one more test than last time, so that got us closer, but not all the way there. <clears throat> Are we allowed to assume that... It's unclear whether this is, whether like the robot will never place itself at the same location as a tree is an additional constraint on the input or not. Coordinates are occupied. Yeah, I guess they don't tell us that we can assume that we aren't going to have any, like, zero sensor readings. Yeah, random says from the wordings it looks like constraint, but... Yeah, I mean, the weird thing, though, is that it says the robot will never place itself at the same location as... It will never be at the same location as a tree, but we have to detect if it's impossible. And... The, uh... We have to detect if it's impossible, and we're never told in the input section that one of SIX and SIY will be non-zero, so... It's a sort of thing where it feels like it should be a constraint, but actually, like based on a literal reading of the problem, I actually don't think that it's a constraint on the input. Um, okay, hold on. Is there anything else that I'm doing wrong here? I think I'm gonna resubmit. I mean, I also am not doing this super competitively, so if I take a bunch of penalties, that's fine. I kind of prefer to just like get through more of the problems. Nope, still wrong. Okay. Uh. Hmm. Maximum in hand distance for e the next lines. To a global coordinate system, and then we get the sensor readings. Um. Are we guaranteed that all sensor that like are we gar yeah are <clears throat> oh it, it will it will detect all the trees around itself okay <coughs> um oh I guess there is an issue of like what if there's some sensor that doesn't detect it uh. Yeah, there, there, this is the issue. There could be a, some sensor that doesn't um, detect um, a tree, and we wouldn't find that. So if, yeah, if not every sense. So now, by checking this, we, we can confirm that every tree, every tree is matched, and so is every sensor. Yep, OK. That's the problem. Oh, 
Is this time limit? Nope. All right, good. Sweet. All right, let's see. Any more problems to try? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight have been done in contest. I have solved eight. Who's this team? Oh, Kason. Um. Yeah, looks like there. Okay, looks like there are eight problems that are pretty easy here, and or I shouldn't say easy, but eight problems that are like very doable. And these last four, it looks like, are where the real fun's gonna begin. So I'm just gonna read all four of these at this point. Um, I don't think I'm gonna do geometry because I don't like geometry, but let's read this just in case. All right, um, looking for an extension point such that um, X and Y are integers. Oh, how many? Oh, this is interesting. Maybe this, is act this could actually be cool. Uh, okay, so we have a set of points. We want to find where we want to find a point such that if we add it to the convex hull, we get another. We get an extra vertex. No three of the new vertices are collinear. We have to count the number of possible extension points. Interesting. Right, because I guess the and I guess the reason why it isn't infinite is that otherwise we could get, we could be in a situation where, or is it like we could have, here I'll, I should actually pull up my zoom and start drawing things. So if our convex hull initially looks like this, if we pick a point, um, actually hold on, is this gonna be about, yeah, if we pick a point all the way up here, our new convex hull will no longer include the old one. So for this to work, we need our convex hull to include all of the points plus our new one. So for example, for it to include all, if we, let's see, hold on. Okay. So let's see, in this square, in this square case, it can be, so I think like, this case in this little triangle, it is infinitely many because like no matter how far we go out in this direction, for example, we'll always have the convex hull. So I want to see the case. So I'm actually like more curious about the case where it's finite, um, which let's have a look at that. So, okay, we'll put zero two here, negative two zeros about here. Wait, no, what am I doing? Zero two, that's up on the Y axis negative two zeros down over here, negative one, negative three down here, one negative three is over here, and two one is up here. Are we guaranteed that these are, that this like, set in a, okay, yeah, so we, we are guaranteed that this is, this is the convex hole, so we don't actually need to run a convex hole finding algorithm. Right, okay. I see, and so basically like, right, we need to find, um, so the a, a point up here can be valid until we get to the point at which these lines intersect. So if the angle between these two lines is like such that they don't, that they like diverge, then we would be, or then we would be fine. But I think that because, yeah, I think that we need to um, basically count the number of lattice points in this tri or in like one of these triangles. Interesting, okay, I don't immediately see a super fast way to implement that. Let's see, hold on. I mean, it basically comes down to counting the number of lattice points in a triangle, and if all the vertices were, are, were integers, then this would just be Pick's theorem. 
I guess maybe what we could do is we could is I could like iterate over each possible x value, and then for each um, x I could like compute the minimum and max, or for each like x I could compute the minimum and maximum y's that are in the triangle. Um, Yeah, this seems kind of annoying. I don't think, I think this is too dangerous. I think I'll be able to do this eventually, but I think I want to try other problems first. Okay. So it says, can you quickly go over the fourth problem from the latest leak code? Um, uh, I don't think I'm going to go over leak code problems today. I want to stay on topic and focus on the problems that the stream was meant to cover. Okay, let's see. End states, direct the edges from each state. Um, okay, this is just like a DFA. Um, we can visit the same state more than once and traverse the same edge more than once, yada, yada, yada. Um, we have a string. We want to generate, ooh, we want to build a DFA recognizing the strings that, wow, this is actually like a theory of computation thing. Um, neat. Okay. We want to generate all the strings that have an equal number of occurrences of S and T. Okay. So there's a theory of computation result that's helpful here, which tells us that, um, okay, this is the S substrings. Um, okay, so I think this is true if the number of values such that, or such that it is possible, I think this is the case. It is po this is true if and only, the answer is if and only if the number of x values x such that this is possible to have x more copies of s than of t is finite. I believe this is the case. Oh, um, but we can later yeah, but we can later go back, uh, or get, or we can eventually get the same number of copies of S and T. So let's see, so I'm gonna, so let's do a bit of case work. So case one is um, neither S nor T contains the other. If this is the case, then this is, then I think this is impossible. I think we um, can't build the automaton. And this is just, so this is, let me see if I can pull up the, or remember what the result is called. Um, this is something that like we, you would go over in a theory of computation or like um, a course on like automaton theory or stuff, or um, like regular languages, that sort of thing. Okay, um, yeah, for anyone who's, curi who's curious, I'm basically just working with some intuition um, from what's called the myhill the road theorem. So if, you're, if what I'm doing here is not making any sense, um, you might look up that theorem and it might be helpful. Okay. So, well actually this is not exactly, this is, might not exactly be true as stated, because uh, it looks like we, oh, I guess um, we need to, and we have some character outside of, yeah, so this is, impo I guess, impossible under certain conditions. Um, yeah, like, it, and we, ha if we have a character, outside of S and T, that is impossible. What happens if 
S contains T. I think then it's always possible. We can just detect whether, um, yeah, because we can just detect whether S contains, or whether we've built more copies of T than S. And at that point, any copy of S we build will have to give us another copy of T. So let's see, I want to understand why this third case is impossible, and then I might move on to look at some of the other problems, because I'm not sure this is going to be easy. Um, actually, I wonder if we can just do like a, if we can actually like do some kind of DP where we almost like explicitly are building the machine. I wonder if the idea is that if the difference in the number of occurrences can become larger than like 500, it can become arbitrarily large. limit on this? Four seconds. Okay. Um... Oh, but we have 50 test cases. Okay, I guess one thought is So if neither S nor T contains the other, and we have um, more than two characters, we can, or then it's impossible because we can, yeah, this is a, okay, this, 
yeah, this does just follow from my hole in a road. Because um, if we, we can like output s and then output some character and neither s than t, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so now we just have the case where s and t or um, neither s nor t contains the other and we have at most two characters. In this case, so first like if there's one character, um, So they, I guess this can be this is impossible because if there's one character only, then whichever of, then whichever of s and t is longer will contain the other. So okay, so we've reduced to the two character case. That's good. Um, let's see if there are any questions on the stream. Not right now. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's see. Why is the case, Why is the answer no for the C C Z Z Z case? get the difference arbitrarily large. Oh, like this? So C, C, Z, Z. Yeah, I see. Okay. So let's see, maybe if we, yeah, maybe this is just like cycle detection, basically. Like, okay. So let's mark a vertex as in cycle if, um, So mark a vertex as S cycling if um, we if it lies in a cycle that increases our difference and T cycling if it lies in a cycle that decreases our difference. If there is an S cycling vertex, um, it, or if there is an S cycling vertex reachable from a T cycling vertex, the answer is no, no, and vice versa. Otherwise, the answer is yes. And a vertex is a pair of pos and x, pos and y. Um, okay, so there's like the, the string part of this problem is pretty easy, and so now there's like this graph theory part of the problem. Um,
Let's see, I guess we might need to exploit the, <coughs> the structure of the problem to try and figure, to like actually find the vertices with the cycles we're looking for. Because doing it um, just using like Bellman Ford or something is going to be a lot too slow. Okay, maybe, let's see, when can we... So if there is a way to S cycle, it seems like we can do it just by, um, like repeatedly, constructing copies of S. So, um, okay, so maybe the answer, maybe the idea is like, if we repeatedly construct copies of check whether repeatedly building copies of S as fast as possible gives us more S than T. And then do the same for T. Um, Oh, maybe not though, because the scene. I guess the issue, like when we have a third character, for example, the off there, there's a better way that we can try to get um, copies of S without ever getting any copies of T. Hmm. Uh, let's see. So maybe if we consider a state as like we just construct bill S and we're at Um, at position P in T. We can over whether we can iterate over whether to start from our next for our next copy of S. And this gets us an edge to a new position in T. So we have 500 vertices and 500 squared edges. And some of these edges involve building an S but not a T. Or no, I guess then though it's still negative cost cycle detection. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna read the other two problems to make see if there's anything really easy. Okay, and then I might come back to this. Pearl for glue to a cord of neck length k. Each unit is either to pearl or empty. Um, pearl cannot be set on a cell containing a path corner. A black pearl must be placed in a cell. Um, in each cell containing a path corner, or oh, must be. Okay, hold on. Okay, this seems like a really ugly constructive. Half of the necklace's length consists of pearls. Is it true that Yeah, this seems okay, this seems really ugly. Okay, I'm not doing this for now. Um, let's look at this one. So, we reach an intersection. There are three branches, take the middle one. Um, there are two, take the one on the left, otherwise end. And then after a certain point, pass will no longer exist. find the location where the jog ends. Um, okay, for this does it work to just like let's see simulate until some path is exhausted. So there can be up to like 10,000 paths. No, 5,000 paths. 2,500 times 4 divided by 2 because each path connects two things. Um, so theoretically, I mean, like finding a cycle, like oh, a five thousand. Um, okay, the implementation for this is kind of going to be a little bit messy. I think this is probably the easiest problem available to me. Eh, this is really ugly though. implementation for this is going to be kind of a pain.
Okay, what do I want to do here? I definitely don't want to look at... I, I guess I should... I, I either want to finish H or type L. I mean, the one nice thing is that 5,000 squared with two second time limit gives me a little bit of extra or of time to like be slightly inefficient if I want. Um, okay. So let's see, how am I gonna, what's the best way to implement this? I'm going to basically, so I'm going to traverse the path. Um, if and then um, and I'm going to store my path, and then if um. I reach a vertex slash orientation I've been at before. We found a cycle, and I'm just going to traverse the cycle until um, one of the vertices is going to go to zero. Interest. If we, and then if we reach zero interest, then we can just reset basically. Okay, I guess I'm just kind of worried about constant factor TLE at this point. Maybe I shouldn't be though. Maybe it won't be that bad. I think it'll be hard to write like a worst case scenario here. So I asked, do I have a Discord server? Uh, currently I do not. Okay. Yeah, I might try and code this. Uh, this is gonna be ugly. So x and y are like just the x and y coordinates, right? So here, in sample input one, one a is it zero zero? Yep. Yeah, okay. So 
So one is so then is one going to be right? So down. So if we down x is up. It's to the left of up y. Um, Shashank asks how many have I solved? I've done eight so far, typing the ninth. So now, if it's a horizontal path, then next of x, so next of a, um, so this a is going up in x, so it's going to be b. Right. Otherwise, x. Oh, and then and, and then B is going to be going down in X, and then otherwise A is going up in Y. Okay, so that's reading of the graph. So it says, what keyboard and switches am I using? Uh, hold on, let me. Uh, I'm using a uh, Vistles LP85. Okay. In order to um, become something, I can't read the whole message. Uh, in order to become red, should I read any competitive programming books? I think if you're just getting um, getting started, the competitive programmer's handbook, which I or can be useful. I linked that earlier, but I'll post it again down here. Okay. So if the character is n, we're going up y. South is down y. East is up x, and otherwise D is 1. No, this is John who gave, who gave you that keyboard. Um, I believe the person who gave me that keyboard would be no, this is John. Okay. Well, a curve path there. Um, Zardis, you are welcome. Okay. Um, what is my speed? When I'm doing a typing test around 150, um, when I'm just like Type, or when I'm just like typing in the real world, can, um, considerably slower, you know, 120 to 130 or so. Okay.
Goodbye, no, this is John. Okay. Um, cool, so we can get our next direction. Um, okay. So first of all, we're going to decrease our valve. And then let's see, so if we otherwise we found a cycle. Then we'll need to do something to deal with it. And then now this of NS and D equals true. D S equals NS, D equals N D. And then in the end we'll output the XY pair. Okay, so now we just need to deal with the cycles. Okay. even find the direction that we went in or that we're going to go in next. What is my PC specs? Um, it's a pretty fast computer. Pretty fast computer. It's like I think um, i seven. So it's an i seven thirteen hundred thirteen seven hundred K um, GTX thirty seventy Ti and then thirty two gigabytes of RAM. Um, you don't need a computer that fast for competitive programming at all. I just do some gaming in my spare time and. Um, so having a fast PC is helpful for that as well as just for like some general productivity things. Okay. Do I play? Um, let's see. Good amount or a good amount of Valorant. Um, I've recently been getting into team fight tactics a bit. Uh, some roguelikes on Steam. A couple of things on my Switch, mostly that sort of thing. Okay. Let's see. Um, Can you defeat tourists? 
Not unless I get lucky. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. different name for this array or maybe I'll just rename this thing Okay, this is a little, wait, hold on, um, okay, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about this, but we'll see, I guess. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, um, you know, this is tag fault, that's helpful. Um, let's figure out where it is. Okay, so it's in the main loop. So we start it, three, is that right? So, yeah, so we start at zero, five, and we're facing north. Okay, that's wrong. If we're facing north, we should be going up to F. So why is it taking us to, oh, I see. Um, wait, no, I don't see. <laughs> Um, okay, maybe I just need to do this. This still definitely doesn't fix the seg fault. Um, do you have a girlfriend? I don't talk about my personal life on my stream, sorry. Okay, D is, I'm getting a D equal to negative one. That's definitely not right. Um, oh. Four. All right, so now we're still. Do I have an Instagram account? Uh, not one that I use for, that I like make public for competitive programming stuff. Okay, why do I keep getting this cycle? Uh, okay, I mean, first of all there, well, let's see, hold on. Where am I actually starting? Okay, so let's see, I'm cycling between going to what, five is F? Wait, no, five is E. Okay, hold on, I think I need to rethink how I'm storing my directions. So let's see. Okay, hold on, if I do it this way, so if D, so if I'm facing north, wait, hold on. Um, Okay, 
Okay. So I guess I want my as sure. So maybe I just want my thing to represent the direction that I'm facing or the direction that I'm coming from. Um, maybe I'll represent, I'll use it to represent the direction that I'm facing. Or that, sorry, the direction that I'm coming from. So let's see, so the direction that I'm coming from is going to be the direction that I just came in flipped by two. Um, Zara asks, what kind of for loop are you using? Can you point to like which part of my code specifically you're asking about? That would be helpful. Whoops, don't wanna copy all that. Okay. So let's see. Go to D, I'm coming from below. I go to F, I'm coming from below. I go to G, I'm coming from the direction one, which is down X, that's right, okay. I go to C, I'm coming from above, and then I get a seg fall. Y. Yeah, so I, at the start of all of my code submissions, you can see this if you look it up on Code Forces. I have a couple of defines where um, basically they give me a way to write for loops more quickly. And then Trav is like for all A in some data structure. Okay, let's figure out where the seg fault is. Somewhere in here, oh, val should be S and D. Okay, um, I'm gonna like run through this and check to make sure that it's okay because I want to make sure my code actually works before I submit it. So let's see, so we go to C from the north. Um, we go to B from direction three, which is the uh, east. Um, As Reflex says, I use Vim 2. What are some useful Vim shortcuts to know? There isn't anything like super competitive programming um, specific that I would use. So I would just look up a Vim cheat sheet and try and learn some of the common shortcuts on those. And if you're also, um, and it sounds like you use Vim already, but if you were just getting started, I would recommend um, Vim Tutor as a way to practice. If any, if like anyone is reading reading this is just getting started. Okay, so we go from B to A, um, and so now we're at Z are coming from the east, and then now. Now what we found now we found a cycle and we're going to iterate across it. I think it should be one time. Actually, hold on. Can we just assume? Do we even need to do all this? I think we can kind. Of, we can just uh, 
Yeah, wait, the number of times we use each edge should just be one always, I think. No. Um, of course not, it has to be, C the CNT should always be one. I can ignore the CNT array. But I do need to, but the number of times we go over the cycle will be however many times we have to, to get something to zero. Okay. Um, yep, works for me. Okay, so let's, hold, let's go back to our output. So after we've done the cycle, okay, so now we're gonna go through it and then we're going to go back to D from the south that is the right direction, right? Okay. We're going to go up to F from the south over to, um, all right, over to G, down to C, over to B, and then now we're going to go up to E, over, over to D, down to A, Hold on. Why are we getting like the edge no longer interesting? It seems like at the end we should be, at the end the value should already be zero, right? Um, Oh, I have to do the reverse of this too. Hold on. All right, well, I'm glad I, uh... yeah, I'm glad I decided to check my work here. Okay. Now we're just cycling over and over again. Why is this? We definitely shouldn't be going over the same edge multiple times. Let's see, so it looks like we're repeatedly going over. Where is, how is F going to zero? And I wonder if we're just like getting some value to be ne negative um, and that's like messing everything up. Oh, yeah, the direction should be for this should be ender x or two. Cool, so after we find the cycle, we're going to go D to F to G to C to B. And then now this edge no longer exists, so we're gonna go up to A to D to A. All right, let's see, is that all the debugs I have to get rid of? Okay. Wrong answer. Okay, debugging. Debugging this is going to be unpleasant to the point that I'm not actually sure I want to do it. I feel like I might just switch problems at this point. Uh, 
I guess it's better than TLE in a way. Oh, hold on. I think I see this. So. Okay, yeah, this is the this is the problem. Um So next is gonna s is gonna be next of so. Yeah, we actually have to force ourselves to choose this path when we start. So val next of s of d two is gonna be minus minus s c is gonna be next of s of d. D is going to be XOR with two. Okay, I think that's, well that fixes a problem. I don't know if it's the problem. At this point, I'm just going to like spam submissions even without like being super careful to. Oh, don't time limit. Don't time limit. Okay. Come on. Please don't TL on fuck. <laughs> All right, time limit. Okay. Uh. What's going to be the easy way to optimize this? This might be rather painful. I maybe should have just finished H first. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think this is just a constant factor problem. I wonder if there's a better way I can deal with it. I guess maybe one thing I could do is I could, is, um, yeah, maybe this is going to help. Um, rather than trying to compute like the next, the next direction to take from any given vertex each time, I'm going to pre-compute the next direction I should take from each vertex and then update whenever an edge no stops being interesting. So, okay. I think I can just reuse a lot of this code. Yeah, this should definitely improve the constant factor, surely. <laughs> so I hope so. This might not be the most expensive part of the pro program, but we'll see. case this edge is no longer interesting so we need to actually you know what? I'm gonna declare yeah this is gonna make things a little nicer I'm gonna declare this globally
and then I think that will meet, and then I can just enclose like an update thing in a function. Why are the codes getting submitted with no judgment? It's just showing as new. I'm not sure. I haven't been having that issue. Okay, hold on. Something is going awry. cycling. Uh, that's not good. Oh, whoops, this should be Should speed things up a little bit. Will it be enough? Let's find out. Uh, now it's wrong answer. Is that on the same test case? Interesting. Well, that does speed things up a lot, although I'm a little bit suspicious actually. I wonder if the TLE was like an infinite loop of some sort. All right. Uh, let's see. It passes like however many test cases this is, like 10 test cases, so or 11, so it seems like there's got to be something pretty subtle and not like a major problem that's breaking the entire code. I guess one issue is I wonder if I'm actually like updating everywhere I need to be, because if not that could be a problem. But no, I mean, everywhere, yeah, everywhere I update the values, it seems like 
I'm being careful to perform my updates. Shoot, I'm dealing with the cycles wrong, aren't I? Yeah, there we go. I think that's it. Whoops. Um. Same test case, yeah. All right.
Um, Shashank, yes, I, uh, I did hear about that. Uh, I have not watched it, no. Naraj asks, what's the last movie or show you've watched? Um, watched a couple episodes of The Office yesterday. Should this be, this should be Ender XOR2, right? Yeah, it should be. Um... Man, this problem is such a pain. Updating all of them here, that's fine. Um, and ideally, by the end of the contest. This problem seems really ugly and I don't think I'm going to have time for it, so I'd like to solve... I'd like to finish this problem if I can, and then solve these two, and I have about two more hours to do it. But pretty soon I might think about just moving on from this problem and figuring out what was going wrong after the contest. But we will see. I'm like very confident that my idea here is correct, um, but the implementation is just so annoying that there's just some bug that I haven't caught yet. And it doesn't help that I don't think the way I'm writing this is actually the nicest way to go about it, but that's fine. Um,
stick in a certain here and see if that does anything. Just to make sure that I'm not doing anything crazy. Someone's asking if like there my CPU fans are in the background. Um, I don't think so. There might be just like um, if there's any background noise, it might just be the AC unit in my apartment. Uh, okay, hold on. Okay, I'm gonna submit with this assert and see if this gets at the problem. Probably not the best move for my penalty time, but it's fine. Runtime error, okay. So, okay, so we know that somehow one of these values is becoming negative. Um, that actually is really helpful information because now there's two possibilities. One is this assert is triggering, which means that we aren't updating frequently enough. It means that we're like trying to use a direction with negative or with like zero. Um, yeah, it means we're trying to use a direction with zero value. Or, um, this assert is triggering, which means that we are removing too much from our cycle. Okay, this is very interesting actually. Um, this is really good information. The interestingness of each path initially is positive, right? Yeah. Okay, hold on. So we're definitely I almost want to check which one it is, but I'm not sure that knowing which of these two asserts gets tripped is helpful. Um, okay. So let's see, after we run up, certainly like the next or whatever like the next direction is should have positive value, right? I think that's right, because if, it, if CT is three, then none of them are zero. And otherwise, if CT, or and otherwise we like encounter whichever one is non-zero here. Okay. Um, so here, let's see. So num psych is going to be the minimum of all of our vowels of the edges on the cycle. Let's see, maybe should I revive? No, I don't want, I don't think I need to revive count. Um, hmm, what's going on here? Okay. 
Oh, you know what? I wonder if it is possible to re to visit in a cycle. I think we can visit the same edge twice. So I think we actually do need this count variable. But I guess one potential issue is what if we traverse the same edge in reverse? Okay, hold on. So, right, if we use the same, right, okay, hold on, I see what, I see what's going on here. Uh, Niraj, my keyboard, I'll copy over the name of it, it's a, uh, Bissell's LP85. If we've used if we've used the same edge in the opposite direction. Then the number of cycles ha cycles halves. Okay, I think this might be the problem. Man, that's really subtle. Um, yeah, next to, is this the right way to go about it? Um, yeah, I think this is fine. I don't really know how to make a test for this case, so I'm just gonna submit and hope it works. At this point, my penalty time is kind of shot anyway. Oh, there we go. Good Lord. Such a bad problem. All right, whatever. Um, okay, finally done with that. Um, okay, let's move on back to H. Yeah, I think the goal is to get H and D by the end. And then I'm just not going to look at J. Let's see, let me check the solve counts and make sure J doesn't. Okay, so J has a solve, H has a solve, D has no solves. All right, so I guess they seem like roughly comparable. Um, Nara says, what's my review of my keyboard? Um, I'm trying to buy a new one. I'm um, So I'm not a keyboard expert, but this has been nice for me. I mean, I like the... It's a smaller one. It doesn't have the num or the ten key number pad, which I like because it gives me more space on my desk, um, and it's really light, which has made it easy to move when I've been traveling. Um, and then and then you know it feels very respon or it feels very responsive, um, easy to type on. I've liked it a lot. I would recommend it. I don't know. I actually don't know if they're still selling it or what it costs. So it might be possible that there are other good keyboards in a cheaper price range. Um, I got this as a, a gift from my brother, but in any case, I will, um, yeah, but in any case, I, I can rec uh, recommend this one. I think it's a good keyboard. Ooh, 170, that's steep. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't know what key, I don't know what good keyboards go for these days. You might be, um, yeah, you might be able to, 
find an equally good keyboard for substantially cheaper. Um, I think my brother might have gotten this as a uh, um, as a gift from the manufacturer to promote it on his YouTube channel, and then afterwards he has way too many keyboards, so he let me uh, pick one of his collection to use. Okay, um, all right, let me get back into the headspace of this problem. Okay, so let me make sure I believe what I wrote down earlier. So if neither, so let's see, if um, neither S nor T contains the other and we have over two characters, or so if one of S or T contains the other, it's definitely possible. I agree with that. If neither contains the other and we have over two characters, it's impossible. And so the interesting case is when we only have two characters. Right, okay. So, and then it seems like it becomes like negative cycle detection on a graph, but we can't do negative cycle detection on a graph in the time complexity that's necessary for this problem, so we'll have to be a little bit smarter about it. So I think the I think the question is, can we make the difference between copies of S and copies of T arbitrarily large? And the thing I just wrote is like this thing here is like something like we have an O of n cubed solution. Um, but the question is can we do better? Can we use, I wonder if we can use the fact that there are only two characters that we're allowed to use. This problem, L, L is not a fun problem. This problem actually is very cool, I think. If they have different lengths, then it seems like we can always make copies of the shorter one without making copies of the larger one. I think this, is this true actually? Um, So let's see, so if we make a copy, so let's say, assume length of s is less than length of t, and so let's write an s, and then let's suppose next character in t is an a. Then we can write a b. And then from there, if the next character, if the next character and so then, um, yeah, we can keep writing the wrong character of T until um, the length of our T prefix is zero. And 
unless, oh, hold on, maybe this is the edge case. Wait, yeah, no, maybe this is, um, okay, so hold on. Okay, I guess in this case we're okay. Um, So like in this sort of situation, we can definitely get a bunch of S's because we can just do A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. So if S and T start with different letters, or start with the same letter, um, then I think I, I think I claim that it's always possible. Because we can write S. So I guess there's first of all, there's an edge case where s is equal to t, and otherwise um, write the wrong letter of t, until our t prefix has length at most 1. And then our s prefix will have at least the same length. then we can just finish another copy of S. Okay, so now we can we only have to deal with the case where S and T start with different letters. Okay, so after we write S, if we try to write T, or if we try to so yeah, let's say assume S starts with A, T starts with B. So let's write S, and then let's see if we can finish another copy of S without creating a t. A t. Well, hold on. Mm. 
Okay, this might be getting too caseworky. Okay, so like one thing that we might be able to do in a lot of cases is we can write S, spam 5000 A's, and then write T, and then write S. And this will work um, oh, and I think this means this should be always impossible. Or, no, it's always possible, basically, to write infinitely many S's and no T's. Okay, so... So this works if S plus a bunch of A's doesn't contain T. So now otherwise S, um, so S has to is starts with A, T is a suffix of S is um, starts with, a, yeah so T is a suffix of S starting with B followed by some number of A's. Okay, so maybe we should like write the wrong character of T to get the prefix of T down as far as possible. And then spam A's. So it looks like here then the only case is that isn't it left. So this works whenever T is not equal to like B A A A A B followed by some number of A's. Okay. So if t is equal to, so if t is just b first of all, then because we already handled the s contains t case, we know s is just a bunch of a's. So we can do the construction. If t is equal to b a a or to b a a or more a's, then what we can just um, write s, write a bunch of b's, um, and then if I see, so if s begins with two a's or more
then it's impossible. Let's see, is the idea we can construct unless um, a or a t of zero is b and the rest the rest of t is a's and the number of a's in the t pre or in the s and the or um starting s is at least the number of t's um or of a's in t Okay, so hold on, let me rewrite all the case work because this is getting really messy. So, one of S or T contains the other. The answer um, is one. At least three characters, the answer is zero. So now there must be exactly two characters. Case three. Um, okay. S and T start with the same letter. Naraj asks, do I watch any kind of sport? Uh, no, not really. The answer is zero. So now they start with different letters. Now the next case is um, hold on. okay. Let's see. So um, did I already graduate? Yes, I graduated from college this May. T starts with B and uh, T is not B and then a bunch of A's. says why don't I try to pursue a career in software engineering um I enjoy like more or I enjoy a lot more um, the sort of algorithmic problem solving that comes up in programming contests more than a lot of the practical work that software engineers do and so um yeah which is why I'm not planning to work as a software engineer just one B because then we can so this is in this case the answer
Okay. Um, this is pretty messy, but I think that this is... Is this right? Um... Okay, hold on, no. Naraj says, do I, um, do I hate Messi now that he came to America? Um, I mean, I don't really follow football, so my opinion is kind of, so my opinion is sort of indifference. I think this case may be impossible, um, but I need to think about this. I guess what if the case, what if the instances of A can overlap? Um, A each instance after the first includes a string of Bs, which is, um, or it includes a string A's, which is preceded by some Bs. Um, these strings cannot overlap. Well, or can they? Um, Hold on. Yeah. I think I have, I think, okay, so I think this is the condition. The answer is one if and only if um, I, er, either holds S contains T or vice versa, or there are two characters and um, and for either S or T, it holds that S contain T is one B and then a bunch of A's. S is one um, A and then a bunch, or S is um, starts with at least as many A's as T has. T has, um, and then S contains a B. Okay, I'm going to try this.
Okay. Um, So S contains both types of characters. So in particular, that means T has to have length at least two in order to not be contained in S. So if S contains T, let's see, I'm going to test the S contains T case real quick. Cool. Um, There's a potential problem here. Oh yeah, hold on, there's an issue with my idea. So uh, we can't... Okay, so when can we not spam the wrong letter of T? We can get the wrong letter of T Okay. Um, because there's no wrong letter that we can use if um, if we're at the end of the first prefix of equal characters. Okay, let me see if this changes what I need to do. So if they start with the same letter. Right, so if after writing S, okay, hold on, I'm gonna, I need to reorganize this a little. Okay, so first of all, if S is all A's, the answer is zero for S to T. All right, so Yeah. 
Yeah, so I guess the case where this is a problem is if after typing s, we're at the last, the second, okay, t is all one character, is all is all a's then one b or all b's then one a and after typing s okay so this seems kind of symmetric to the other case Which I guess makes sense. Yeah, I guess this is just the first case applied to rever um, re the reverse of the two strings. See, what's the case with this this handle? So if um, and yeah, if I don't do this, then I get. So that fixes that case. Um, okay, I don't have much confidence in this, but I'm going to submit it. Let's go. Um, I kind of want to see how I'm doing compared to the real teams. Looks like I would be in second just behind um, the really insane team that is probably going to win NAC, which given that there's three of them and one of me, I think the fact that I'm only three problems behind them is, or sorry, only one problem behind them and doing pretty well on penalty time is solid. And it looks like, is this actually tourist? I don't think so. Um, who's this? Oh, Nick Wu. Um, very cool. Yeah, I mean, seems good to me. I guess, let's see. Um, how long do I have left? An hour and a half? Is there any world in which I AK this? Probably not, to be honest. Um, I don't know, maybe, well, let's see, hold on. What's the, what's the scoreboard look like for J? Okay, J has been solved by two teams. What team is this? Um, okay, so J has been solved by two teams. A, or D has been solved by no teams. Interesting. MIT is trying it, but they're uh... yeah. MIT okay. MIT is trying D. What other? What else haven't they gotten? Oh, they have eleven. Okay, they just need one more for eight, for the AK. Uh, 
Um, Okay, do I want to do, I guess maybe I, okay, I'm going to use the restroom for a moment and then I'm going to spend a couple of minutes like thinking about J, um, although it seems, it must be hard to get exactly right if MIT has taken so long, like let's see how long, MIT took how many submissions? Yeah, MIT first tried L, which is kind of insane actually, but then took six tries to get J right. Um, and this other team that solved J, where are they? They only took two tries actually. I feel like there's gonna be a big bottleneck where a lot of teams have eight and then some have nine, um, but we'll see. Anyway. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I think the strat or I think I'm going to take a restroom break for a moment um, and maybe grab a snack, and then I'll try. I'll think about J for a bit, and then if I don't think of anything, I'll just try and code up D. Cool. I will be back in just a moment. Oh, interesting. You have to output the lexicographically smallest path. Oh, wait, hold on. There's only two to the... Um... Wait, no, hold on. Mm. 
Yeah, prune brute force actually might work here. Yeah, because for each black pearl, there are, um, there must be like a, a, a white pearl or a chord sequence um, following it. It's not obvious to me from the sample case whether um, all black pearl or whether all corners have to correspond to black pearls. I'm gonna Google up this uh, puzzle and I'm gonna see if I if it. Okay, yeah, it looks like not all corners have to be a black pearl, so <clears throat> that might make things a little bit trickier in terms of just brute forcing this. What's the time limit? Five seconds. Um... I know I have I have a hunch that these that all these constraints are Yeah, I have a hunch that all of these constraints are intended to make it easier to brute force. Especially I think if we prune it well, then we should be able to get this to work.
the path. Um, Uh, Finn says, uh, problem H author here. I've had this stream out in the background while I monitor things. Thanks for sharing your thought process for working through that problem. It was neat to see. Yeah, thanks for writing it. It was a fun problem. And I actually haven't ever seen a problem um, along these lines where like having some prior knowledge of um, atomic or uh, of like the actual theory behind DFAs meaningfully helps to solve a competitive program problem. Um, so I thought it was really cool. I enjoyed it. So let's see. Um, so the order, the alphabetical ordering is east, which is um, so east is increasing y, um, north, which is decreasing x. South, which is increasing x, and then w, which is um, decreasing y. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So hold on. So in order to check if a black pearl has a corner, or if neither thing adjacent to a black pearl has a corner, 
we need to reach um, its distance plus two. Same for white pearls, I think. So the nth, so yeah, the kth move should get us back to the beginning. And so now we just need to Now we just need to check any pearls occurring at the first few positions. What's the minimum length here? Five, perfect. So for a white to be okay, we need um, okay. So we need the white thing. So we need the one coming out of it to be the same as the one coming in. So that's t of p should be equal to t of p minus one, and then we need either p minus one to be a corner. or meaning that, okay, so this thing would have to be a corner, which would mean p minus one is not equal to p minus two, or the next thing is a corner. So okay, and then for a black to be okay, we need to, so we need the black thing to be a corner and then we need neither of the next things to be a corner. Wait, hold on, should this be? This would be P and P plus one, right? Um, yeah, P, so this is P plus one, P, P minus one, P minus two. Yep, these are the ones that should matter. This means, so before we finish, we need to, all right, so if it's white, return, okay, white P, Return OK, black P. And so we need, so we won't have been able to check OK. All right, so this is OK. We need, we haven't been able to check OK of K minus. K minus three, if we only know 
Yeah, k minus 3 we can do. Okay, if k minus 1. So we don't want to make sure we aren't going in the opposite direction of where we just were. Okay. So if the opposite of this direction is equal to the one we just went on, then continue. Now we can just do go p plus 1. So we're going to append um, that direction and then pop back at the end. Is this? Um, Shashank asks, how many have I solved? I have solved 10 so far. This is going, if I solve this one, it will be my 11th. Oh, I forgot to actually uh, call this function. Um, okay, so the first case, we're gonna, I said we were gonna start with either E or N, right? Oh, um, and I also have to check So if p, so we know t up to p minus 1. So if p is at least 4, all right, so, um, yeah, OK. How many are there? And did you solve j? I am typing j right now. And there are um, 12 problems in total. So I have J, and then once I finish this, if I get a C, I'll have just D left. Um, yeah, so that's where we are now. Um, all righty. So yes, yeah, so we want to try E first. E is what? E going east is going to increase y.
Okay, so I've made sure that it doesn't cross itself. Um, I've made sure that I'm only using valid positions. Yeah, I think we're fine, hopefully. Wait, hold on, I think my okay fun. Oh wait, no, my okay function is fine. All right, um, let's see. See, this says I'm getting impossible, which is incorrect. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to like see when. Um, oh, hold on! I see what the what one issue is. So this should be S of P. Is what I should be checking. Um, all right. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to see how far I get along the correct path. Okay, so I get up to fit. I, I get up to um, sixteen. Oh, hold on. I think this should be T. Um. Okay. Do I get to? Is this the right answer? No, this is Yeah, okay, this is not um yeah, we needed to go Wait, hold on. I'm confused here. Uh so E E N N E E S S S S S W W W W N N. Okay, why am I E is y plus one. Okay, so why is it, so it seems like my coordinate is my coordinates aren't making sense to me because I should be getting to like since I'm decreasing everything by one I should be getting to two zero if I replace this e with an n. Okay, I guess that's true. Okay. Um. All right, let's try and figure out what condition is being failed here. So the last letter here is a dot. So why can we not, um, yeah, so S of P when P is 15. Right, so we can't go south. Why is this just not running now? Is this waiting for more input? Am I, oh, am I running the wrong thing? Yeah, hold on. All right. Whoops.
Okay, so we definitely get up to this point. Oh, wait, not quote, test to not be quoted. Duh. Okay. Um, So we can go to zero one three. Oh, hold on. This is the problem. So if P Yeah, we can go to a use cell if it's the last one. Nope, uh hold on. Okay, so we are getting the right um, string in here. Um, okay. All right, so we're failing okay of K plus one. All right. So, okay, hold on. So we have, so we have N, K minus one. Oh, now I see what the issue is. Okay, I think that's right. Okay. Let's see what happens here. I think this will be informative because if this is TLE, that'll be useful information, and if this is wrong answer, then that is also useful information. Um, all right, hold on. Niraj asked, have I ever tried organizing or writing problems? I've written a couple of problems that have appeared on the use of code. Other than that, um, no, extensively, I haven't proposed a code forces around or anything like that. And I haven't, um, let's see, and then um, I have like I have done a bit of like organize or contest organization in the past. I think the most notable example was I ran um the uh, twenty twenty lockout championship, which was a I think like two hundred and fifty participant lockout tournament held uh, held back in the second half of twenty twenty. Oh wait, hold on. This is of course. No, we have to we have to try all directions because it might not be symmetric. Okay, that was just silly of me. So S is. And then, yeah, west is y minus 1. Yeah, OK. Yeah, of course, it might be that the answer doesn't have to start with e or n, because it might not be symmetric. 
make sure this is still listed as impossible, should be. Um, Let's see what happens now. Okay. I'm definitely nervous about time limit even at this late stage because it could be that there's just some very specific edge case that breaks my solution, but nope, accepted. Wait, 2.12 times? Oh yeah, 2.12 out of a five second time limit. Perfect. Um, that puts me back in the lead, and now I'm just one away from the all kill. Let's see, has MIT all killed yet? Oh, they've six plus six, good lord. Um, looks like I'm, looks like I would have been at least a second at the real thing, and again, given that this MIT team has, um, Shang Chi Dai, who is rated above me on Code Forces, plus two other LGMs. I think the fact that I've been like, I think I'm a little bit, yeah, I've been very close to keeping up with them through the first 11 problems. So I actually feel like this has been a very strong performance since presumably if I had two LGM buddies sitting with me or if I had like my two regular teammates, uh, we could be even further ahead of where we are now. Um, yeah, so this gives me, how long do I have to do? 47 minutes to try and type D. So at this point, I'm pretty sure this problem is basically just count the number of lattice points in a triangle. And you know, I actually, well, I'm gonna Google this actually. This seems like there should be template code to do this. Count lattice points in triangle code forces. Uh, Actually, hold on, is this, what's, let's see, Yusuko. This reminds me a little bit of a Yusuko problem from a while back, but I don't think that one was lattice points. One thing I could try is I, so let's say we have a triangle. Like this. One thing I could do is I could count the number of lattice points below either of these two lines and then subtract out the number of lattice points below this third line. But it seems like that could get kind of edge case heavy. I think like, okay, so if I have a triangle and yeah, if I have a triangle and for some X, I know a point inside that triangle. So I know that like X, Y is in the triangle. I can just use binary search to find the other points of the triangle. So I guess maybe what I can do is I can, okay, so give it a triangle. Um, I can iterate over the three edges. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna iterate over the edges. I'm gonna, um, check it for, yeah, for each edge, I'm going to check if X, um, yeah, so I'll check if X, C, and then the ceiling of of the y coordinate of x on this edge. Um, is in the triangle. And then if so, I can binary search. One thing I'm going to need to do is point, is like check if point is in a triangle, but I'm guessing there's template code that'll help me do that. Um, check if point is in the triangle. Okay, 
so this makes sense. We could use the uh, we could use the shoelace formula to calculate the area and make sure it works out. Um, I wonder. I'm a little bit worried about the constant factor. I'd like to do it a little bit faster. Um, I also it might be helpful to have like a rational class so that I can um, not work with any decimals because I think working with doubles would be pretty bad here. Shoelace formula should be fine if efficiency. So like the idea for this is that if we want to check if a point X is in the triangle, what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect it to the three or to the three vertices, and we're gonna check if the sum of these three triangles areas is equal to the area of the big triangle. And that'll hold if it's in the triangle, but if we have another point like this, we do like these connections then the area of this uh, this triangle plus the area of this triangle plus the area of this triangle will not be equal to um, yeah it, it'll it'll not be equal to the area of the whole triangle okay um cool I guess one potential issue is efficiency because the x coordinates could actually be get to be quite large. Um, I'm gonna look up counting lattice points in the triangle again because it really seems like this should be pretty well known. Maybe I will try, um, yeah, maybe I will try this other idea of like counting points below a line. Um, I think basically the issue, well, hold on, okay. Okay, I mean, it seems like for every triangle, wait, is this true? Maybe it isn't. Yeah, I guess like what I'm worried about is there could be a situation like, where you have like this really narrow little triangle that looks over here. Um, And then it's kind of a pain to calculate the points inside of it.
Okay, here's an idea. Maybe what we can do is, so I think the coordinates should be bounded by, oh, what's the time limit for this, by the way, I want it. Four seconds. Okay, I think the coordinates are bounded by around 1e6. Maybe what we can do is we can use the fact that like, well, wait, no, hold on. Um, okay, let's see. So let's find the first X contained Wait, hold on. Okay, for a given x, the minimum, um, maybe we can just figure out we can just check which sides of the triangle contain this x and then it just must be higher than intersect the intersections. I think this works. So like if we for, we can for e for like x right around here for example, um, we can just like find the first integer point above here and the last integer point below here, um, and this will take like about yeah fifty times one million. Okay, and I think we can do all of this in ints, and that will be fine. Okay, how long do I have to type this? Like half an hour, give or take? 35 minutes, all right. Um, This is really, this is going to get kind of ugly. Okay, so step one, we're gonna build the triangles. So that's gonna involve connecting two segments. And then the annoying thing is we need to check that these segments connect on the right side. And I think that's going to be like some cross product magic of some kind, but I need to figure out how to do that. Um, and then once I know how to connect the two segments, I can, um, once I have the two, the two segments, I can find the minimum and maximum X values in the triangle for e and for each X find the minimum and maximum y's allowed and add to the answer. And then let's see, so we're given the vertices in counterclockwise order. So Maybe the way we can check this is make sure is we can just make sure that vi intersection vi plus one are counterclockwise using uh, the cross product. Okay, I think I'm ready to type. Uh, 
Um, and one thing I'm going to do to start us off is, let me see if this is in Cactyl actually. Um, Yeah, I don't think that, I'm not sure I have like a nice template for rational arithmetic, which is slightly annoying. Um, okay. Why don't I have my template? Oh, there we go. I'm going to, maybe I'll use LLs just to be safe for now and we can revisit later if TLE seems like an issue. You know, I might need to just do fractions here. This is, I feel like we might run into overflow even with long longs. It's getting kind of nasty. Um, 
coordinates are small as well. I think precision actually won't be an issue. Plus I can just copy in a template now. So here's our intersection. All right, so first of all, if the two lines never intersect, then that means there are infinitely many points. So what do we put there in that case? We put infinitely many. I'm going to have to output this multiple times. I'm just going to... Okay, there we go. So now... Let's see, so I think this is... I'm going to check it counterclockwise again. I have not done that much geometry in a while. How much time do I have? 25 minutes, give or take?
I'll just check if this is giving the right results afterwards. So now what? Okay, so hold on, how do I need to, so now I need to find y value of x on a line. Okay, so So first of all, if this is just a uh, as an edge case, so if it's a vertical line, then we'll continue. Otherwise, our y value is going to be um, okay. Hold on. So times our x value minus p of j or minus p of j dot f divided by p of j plus one dot f minus p of j dot f.
Oh, and I have to make sure this is actually on the line. So if I minus epsilon is at least Oh, whoops. Should be x and y, not first and second. Okay. Uh, now we test this. What, what problem is this? D? Okay. Um, Oh wait, this should be equal. This should be equal to one. Okay, now I'm getting zero. That's not right. Okay. So let's see, let's draw this out. Okay. A negative two zero. Okay, hold on. So in the sand so the sample cases, this little pentagon. All right, so we're looking at the negative two. Okay, so we're looking here. This is our triangle. It says the intersection point is what? Um, it says negative one. Okay, it says negative one, negative three. Or no, um, negative five, negative three. Is that right? Yeah, okay, I think I believe that. Um, oh, hold on, I see. Hold up. What? Uh, what's going on here? Yeah, that's a very different epsilon. <laughs> okay, so now we now we know we're undercounting. Um,
Okay, so I think this should be negative. This should be negative four to negative three. Hold on, let's, let's change my epsilon a little bit. What happens if I do long doubles? Oh, you know what it is? It's because it's rounded down towards zero. Um, shoot, okay, how do I deal with this? Um, is why it's four. Oh wait, hold on. So why is next time negative five equaling negative three? So ceiling, oh, right. Okay, so this one is zero to zero. So it looks like I'm missing a lot of points this way. Hold on. Um, What's going on here? Oh. Shoot. I guess there's always some danger to using the same, basically the same variable name. So now we're missing a smaller number, but still some.
So let's see. What are the, so the lattice points are So we have negative 2, 0, negative 1, negative 3, and negative 5, negative 3. So let's see if x is... negative 2, let's say. Negative 2 is going to intersect at negative 3. Hold on. Um, Which one does it intersect? Does negative two intersect at x equals negative one? So negative two, because negative two zero is one of the points, and we should be just below that, right? Um, Yeah, I think negative 2, negative 1 should be in here. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah, okay, so why is negative 2, negative 1 not in here? Or why is negative 2, negative 1 in here? So negative 2 should intersect. Let's see, we should have zero in here. Okay, what am I doing wrong here? I think this line has some issues. How do I feel about this epsilon? Let's see, what if I do 1e negative 12? Does it work now? And actually, can I go back to regular double? Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm on regular double. pretty early on. Uh, seems unlikely that that's precision issues. I 
I think just in case though, let's see, I'm gonna try, let's try long double with a smaller epsilon. And then if that doesn't work, let me think about what I'm gonna try. Or with a larger epsilon, sorry, I should say. Still wrong. Um, Yeah, I mean, my guess is that there's just something going wrong here, but I don't think I'm going to really have time to debug it. So let's see how large our coordinates can be up to a million. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm just gonna try. I think this is the highest epsilon that'll be acceptable. Okay, uh, probably not an epsilon. Um, yeah, it probably isn't just epsilon tweaking then. Let's see, is there anything else obvious that I can fix in the next 52 seconds? Honestly, if I had to guess, there's like some edge case, some um, or like some specific configuration that I haven't thought of that breaks my solution. So, uh, I think that's probably all for me. Um, that was pretty good though. That was actually a solid contest. I mean, the one thing that was a little bit unfortunate is taking so long and so many tries to do L. Um, but I find it seems like I did reasonably well. So let's see, yep, contest is over. Looks like, I think I won the open division. Um, yep, looks like, oh hey, this team, who's on this team? Oh yeah, yep, um, that checks out. Yeah, honestly, I feel like one of my ICPC teammates would probably be able to solve D um, if we gave him enough time, but unfortunately, today I was uh, all on my own. Um, if I had to guess, I would say MIT, yeah, if I had to guess, I would say MIT probably didn't get D if they spent 15 more submissions on it, but who's to say? Um, so that actually is pretty good. Like that was remarkably close actually to um, solving. Yeah, that was remarkably close to beating MIT. And in fact, I actually think that I, well, I don't know. I think that I might be, if I switched L, if I did L after H and J that rather than before, I think that actually might reduce my penalty time by enough to be MIT. Um, or, you know, of course, if I take fewer penalties on L or on G. Um, but, you know, I also was trying to explain all the problems as I went, and so I felt like this is, this was a really good time for this kind of screencast. So, um, yeah, I think I can be happy with that performance. Let's see, I wonder if there's going to be a scoreboard reveal live stream somewhere. I guess probably not if they're just going to do it in person, but we'll see. Uh, Shashank asks, will I upsolve D? Yeah, I'll probably at least try and figure out what the test case is that broke my solution once, um, or, um, once the uh, test data comes out. I mean, to be honest, geometry is just such a weakness of mine that I'm guessing that I like wouldn't be surprised if the error that I made is pretty standard. Who's on this third MIT team, by the way? Oh, Anton Trigub and uh, Tlatwani. Very cool. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if I just did something a little bit goofy that people like my CPC teammate, Henry, who are more experienced with geometry than I am, would like immediately know and be able to fix. But since I just haven't solved a lot of geometry problems, there's a lot of standard ideas that I'm just not that familiar with. But anyway, it looks like there's a pretty sizable gap between this top MIT team and the last one. So I still feel good about my prediction that they're going to win NAC and maybe world finals. Um, yeah, it's a stack team. 
but then um, it is interesting to me that there were not, or it looks like there were pretty few teams that solved J and um, L, although more people started trying L in the last hour. So I think none of these teams can, yeah, none of these teams have a small enough penalty time to surpass me unless this MIT title team solved all three problems in the last hour. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, so that is where we are. Pretty good contest. I enjoyed the problems. Um, which ones were my favorites? H was my favorite. Um, Finn, if you're still around, great problem. Loved it. Um, it's like, Felt kind of caseworky at first, but then ended up working out really nicely. And again, I think the underlying theory is just super cool. Other than that, um, yeah, I mean, there's a big gap between the first eight problems and the last four, I think. Um, and in this, uh, I think I finished eight problems at the 81 minute mark and then spent the rest of the contest doing three others and then making progress on a fourth. What was G again? Which was this one? Oh, right, this one. Yeah, yeah, I think H was the best problem in the set, but it was pretty fun. L was like, L was kind of tilting, and it feels like the sort of problem that people just like put in a set because they want to, uh, I don't know, I don't know how I want to phrase this, but L is the sort of problem that you put in a set when you want to um, put your contestants through a great deal of pain and then see who comes out of it, or who comes out of it with the fewest penalties. Oh, Ian says G trolled me by putting... I thought about that. Like, there's a point earlier where I was like, is the, is, the, is the claim that, like, the robot will never start or will never start at the position of a tree, is that a constraint on the input or is that something we have to check? So um, that's interesting to hear because I changed I changed that early and then I, it didn't change my result. Um, but then I, I guess if I hadn't done that, then one of my later submissions would have also been wrong answer. So um, let's see. What else is there? Um, let's see who I'm kind of curious who else. Oh, this is Miami University. Um, that's interesting. That's not a, uh, I think this is, they haven't um, had a super strong ICPC performance in a while. Ohio State too, actually. That's a really strong performance. Wonder if any of these people are like on code force or something or were grinders in high school. That's pretty cool. All right, um, fun contest. Uh, I will stick around for just a moment to answer any last questions. Um, so Zardis asks, have I done any contests on Kaggle before? I have not. Um, Shashank asks, how many problems have I solved in my competitive programming journey? So let's see, on Code Forces, I have solved uh, 2,900. I would guess that Code Forces is a majority of the problems I've solved, but not a super strong one. So. If I had to guess, somewhere in the range of 4,000 seems right. Of course, you know, not all of those problems were at the, at the right level to be like super good practice. And I think really like the 1,000 or so problem, the 1,000 to 2,000 problems that were like right at my skill level at the time were the most valuable to me. Uh, but there are also a lot of problems that I've solved just by doing, for example, div three rounds or like div two ABCs that are like not at a level where they're going to be especially challenging for me at this point. And those count towards my problem solve statistic, but also aren't really reflective of any real effort I'm putting into training. So um, Kwikwa asks, did you solve J? Yep, I did. Um, here, let's see if I think, was it my first submission or my second? Yeah, second two tries. Um, yep, I just, J, or if you're curious, the solution to J was just to like do a recursive, or do a recursive brute force pruning as you go. And, um, yeah, and just like try the directions in order of, or in the alphabetical order, and then print a solution as soon as you find one. It's... It's a little bit weird because my solution passes in two seconds out of a five second time limit. And for a recursive brute force problem, this seems like the constant factor there is pretty annoying. Like people who did this in a slightly less efficient way than me for some reason could have easily been forced to do constant factor optimization, which I think is a little sad. Um, yeah, cool. So, all right, that's a contest. 
Shashank asks, do I like Code Chef? I think um, not as much as like Code Forces, but I mean, I do their contests occasionally. I think they're, I think that there's a lot of variance in the quality of the contests there, especially now. Um, there was a period, I think it was in mostly around 2021, back when um, Nick was the uh, head coordinator, where I felt like the Code Forces prom sets were on par with, co or, sorry, the Code Chef prom sets were on par with Code Forces quality wise. And um, because there were $100 prizes for the top 10 overall in Division 1, you could count on having some really high quality competition there. And so I think that was definitely the peak of Code Chef. And um, since then, it's been a little less exciting to compete. But I'll still like do their contests if I, if you know, on the or on Wednesdays I don't really have anything better to do. Um, they're not bad at, at all, and um, especially like there's some there's some contests where they end up using really good problems. Shashank asks, most of the questions will be based on ad hoc and Code Chef, right? Um, I'm not familiar enough with the recent Code Chef problems to um, yeah to give a super precise answer to that. All right, great. Um, well, I think that's all for today. So thank you all for watching the stream. Hope you all um, found it interesting and maybe even learned something. And I will see you all next time.